Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Hollywood United Methodist Church. We are glad that you have joined us in person and online this morning. Please stand as you are able for our opening hymns.
young folks who want to join us up here for a few children's moments before we go off to children's church and youth group today. Great. All right. So last week we started our program on Compassion Camp and we talked about shelter. So let me ask you, what are some things you do when it's raining? to provide shelter for yourself. What do you do when it's raining? Um, put an umbrella on you. Right, you put an umbrella over your head. It for, protects you from that. What about when it's windy? What, do you, what can you do if it's really windy outside? Get a jacket. Oh, say that really loud. Get a jacket. Right, do you think maybe you'd put your hood up too? Yeah. Okay, so what do you do? Has anybody had to, has anybody ever felt an earthquake before? We, at school, uh, we pretend there was an earthquake drill. And what did you do? We all go outside and gathered. Yeah, so you go outside and gather. So when different things occur, we have shelter that protects life. So let me th ask you a question. One of the things we talked about was the shelter for a bird, and a bird lives in what? A nest. A, a nest. bird nest. A bird nest, good. So what is, if it's raining, what do you think birds do when it's raining for shelter? Go in their bird nest. Go in their bird nest. What do you think they have on, ab above their bird nest? Where's their bird nest located in a what? Um, in a tree. Right, so they might have leaves that protect them. Right? And maybe in the wind, they have their nest all around them to help protect them. So that's what we're going to be talking about in different kinds of weather and different things that we do. Shelter protects life, all kinds of lives. And we can think of some things that we can do both for our animal and plant friends uh, during times of need and also for uh, our friends who may need shelter in the world during times of need when maybe they don't have a roof over their head or it's windy or it's rainy or there's an earthquake or something like that. So that's what we're going to do today, all right? And we also have our first Sunday of children's choir practice today. Who's excited about that? Oh, Annalie's excited. All right, we're gonna bow our heads, uh, say a prayer, and then we'll go off to children's church and youth today. Dearest Lord, thank you for the shelter that you've provided both physically for us and for our souls and a place where we can be authentically ourselves here in your church. Help us uh, be a place of shelter for all li God's living creatures, both here and as we move out into the community and in everything that we do. And all God's children said... Amen. All right. And as we go off to Children's Church, which is in Grant Hall and Youth Group in the Grace Room right out here, I ask you to stand and greet uh, everyone here and joining online as you're comfortable. Be with you and peace to our friends in the balcony thank you for all that you do to help make this worship service wonderful as our young people leave us to go and learn more from April and Kevin in our incredible children's program I invite you to center yourself for a time of prayer brought there together by our wonderful choir
creator God. You are the Lord of sea and skies. You rule over all the earth, and we are blessed to be but a part of your creation. We thank you for the beauty of this earth. We are grateful for the long summer days and the end of a long summer, for the coming cool nights of fall and for the approaching harvest. We are grateful for all that you have granted to sustain us. On calm and easy days, we remember where this precious bounty comes from, and we offer you our thanks. But God, we confess it is on the days when the breeze turns into a gale, when the skies turn gray, or the sea turns even a little bit unruly, that we begin to fear, and doubt creeps in. Strengthen our faith. Sustain us, give us resolve, still our fear in even the most difficult storms. Remind us always of your presence as we navigate life's difficult waters. Pour your Holy Spirit over us into each and every one of us to strengthen us on this journey. May that spirit cover the face of the earth, its land, its seas, and all its people to ease the grief of those who have lost in Morocco during the earthquakes, those who are suffering and struggling with financial instability, to give strength to migrants on their journey as they seek safe shelter in a new land, and back here home to us in our own communities as we seek to challenge the housing crisis and homelessness in our own community each of us facing our own difficulties and carrying our own weights. Fill us with your inspiration and help us to understand that there is no work too great, no struggle too broad that we cannot bear with you by our side. This morning we give thanks for the life of Reverend James Lawson as our conference and many others gather to celebrate his birthday, his 95th birthday yesterday. We offer gratitude for his long service to the church and to our world as the powerful voice of the nonviolent theologian that shaped the civil rights movement. What a blessing he has been to Los Angeles to continue his ministry here. May his work carry on. God, we lift up to you Marty for healing. We pray for Diana and some serious health concerns. We pray for Philip's family on his passing May you welcome him home with grace and love and assuage their grief. We lift up prayers to you for Sebastian, for Dora, and for the Blondells. Be with them all. This morning we also pray for the United Methodist Church and our College of Bishops during this period of discernment, and especially for our own Bishop Dottie. May you guide her work and ministry and make it bold here in Southern California. There are many prayers left unsaid, and now we offer them to you silently, all that lingers in our hearts and minds. Dear God, you are ours and we are yours even from before we took our first breath. You have made yourself known to us over and over again and you sent your son Jesus to remind us just how loved we are and how we might be your servants of love in the world. We are grateful for his life and for the ability to follow his path as we seek to know you and to build the beloved community. And we offer you the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good Sunday morning, church family. How are we today? Are we doing good? All right. It's good. I, I love standing up here. I can see all your smiling faces. So uh, before we get going, let's all check in if we would. Get out your phone, scan that. Uh, you can just drop your name in. Um, and there's a place for prayer requests. I get those every Monday and I share them with the uh, pastoral team. So if you have any, please add those there. I hope you're joining us today for a very special class. There's two in a row, one this Sunday, one next Sunday. It's called Unclobber the Bible, and Dr. Reb Ed Hansen is leading this. And it's going to be in the chapel at 12.15, so plenty enough, enough time to grab your cookies, your coffee, talk to a few people, and then walk over into the chapel. Um, about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on people's conversations and questions, but uh, we'll, we're doing it this Sunday. We're going to go over the Old Testament and then New Testament next Sunday, so please join us. Uh, hot, uh, hot news, breaking news. Um, on Friday, the 29th, our documentary, The Red Ribbons of Love, which is a short, it's been uh, touring around the country uh, doing film festivals, and it will be at Palm Springs Film Festival, the LGBTQ Film Festival. And we'll be doing a screening uh, at 12.15 on this coming Friday, and Rev. Kathy is going to be there in attendance. So if you happen to be in the area, please stop on by. Um, we will be premiering, though, the uh, documentary short on World Aid Sunday here, December 3rd. So keep that. Oh, by the way, if you didn't get one of these, please do. This actually has everything. I'm calling it a fridge flyer. This has everything we're doing in the next four months. Also, we'll remind you about the World AIDS Sunday. Um, next Sunday, we have Meet the Music Department, which is happening in the parlor. It's a great time to see how you can get involved with our amazing music team. Um, so if you're uh, coming next Sunday, make sure you come on over to the parlor, meet the music team, and also I hear there might be cake or a special dessert. We'll have to see what goes on. Um, small groups are happening as well this fall. I just uh, added one that I'm going to be leading uh, over in the valley on Wednesday nights. So if you are interested in any of our small groups, there's about seven or eight happening. Go ahead and scan that QR code. Um, it's also on the little fridge flyer, and it's also on any of the welcome tables. You can scan that QR code later if you need to, but we'd love to get you involved. Then coming up, we love to talk about food. So our next big food event is Divine Diner. That is happening, and it's the first time it's happened since 2019. Um, and it's happening. It's our youth group fundraiser. It's happening on the 22nd, right after church. It'll be a grill cookout of some sort that they're going to do for us, and it is to help fundraise for their Christmas shop, where they buy gifts and invite families in need to get those gifts for free. Of course, we have our new members class coming up at the end of the month, and if you'd like to sign up for that, just go ahead and email Rev. Kathy, let her know you're interested, and that is happening on the 22nd and the 29th. Of course, all of these things you can find at the welcome table. So come see me after church. I'll be out in the courtyard at the welcome table out there. And we can, uh, I can answer any questions. All that we do here is made possible with, by you, with your prayers and your presence and your service and your gifts. So as the ushers come forward and we put up the QR code for online giving, give as you're able so we can continue to do ministry here in the heart of Hollywood. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. 
This morning's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A gale arose on the lake so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. This morning, we continue our fall sermon series, wrestling with the questions that Jesus asked. It's based on a book uh, by author and United Methodist uh, pastor, uh, Magrata Vega, we're in it, we're exploring six of the most provocative questions that Jesus posed to others. Jesus liked to ask questions, many of which cut right to the heart of what it meant to follow him. Why are you terrified? What do you live for? Last week, we began the series by asking the question, who do you say that I am? And our question for this morning is, why are you afraid? Now, we're entering the scary season. No, not Halloween. I mean, election season. <laughs> Can I get an amen for that? You are not imagining things. Election season, I think, now begins the day after the previous election. It begins earlier and earlier every four years. And there are politicians who would have us believe that there is danger lurking behind every horizon, and the only way to be safe is to elect them. Hmm. But we live in a culture that thrives on reminding us just how much there is to be afraid of. A recent documentary called Thrive describes how entire cottage industries have been developed to keep us in a constant state of panic. Sad to say, there are also preachers who would try to convince you that evil is just around the corner 
so you'd better come to church and you'd better put a check in the offering plate. Well, you need to do those two things anyway. <laughs> Not because I'm scaring you into doing it, because it's part of your faith journey, your own discipleship. The bottom line is that there's fear all around us and we've been conditioned to believe it even when it is irrational. Jesus acknowledged the reality of fear in our lives, typically through the context of or the metaphor of a storm-tossed sea. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all record of Jesus quieting the storm. Matthew does twice. In today's reading and in Matthew 14, which I used as my sermon basis last August 13th. Now, in that sermon, we focused on Peter and his lack of faith that caused him to not be able to walk on water and go out and meet Jesus. But in the three other versions of the story, there are many similarities. The disciples are on a boat on the storm-prone Sea of Galilee. The wind and the waves escalate to the point of sheer terror and fear grips the disciples. Then they have the presence of mind to wake up the peacefully sleeping Jesus. He gets up, he speaks into the wind, and calms the storm in an instant, leaving a completely soaked band of disciples in disbelief. But in Matthew's version, which we just heard, before he speaks to the sea and the storm, Jesus first speaks to the disciples. Now they were panicked and they were angry when they woke him up. Lord, rescue us, we're going to drown here. But first Jesus says to the disciples, why are you afraid? You people of weak faith. Now, was he trying to rebuke them? Was he disappointed in them? Was he really sleepy in that moment? Jesus is asking, hey, what is wrong with you people? What don't you get? How could you be afraid if I'm right here with you? Was that what Jesus was saying with this question? Or, or was it just simply a matter of curiosity? Why are you afraid? What is it that scares you? What's the limit of your faith right now? Now, growing up, I was taught mostly just a very, very surface meaning of this water story. Remember, children, if you're ever caught in a storm, try to be a little more like Jesus. We were taught to see Jesus as some heroic figure who gives us an example of how to be courageous when the waves threaten to sink us. And the great theologian Lynn Sweet says that the purpose of this story is completely different. In the ancient world, the sea symbolized the powers of chaos and evil. But Jesus commands it to be still. Only Jesus can control and master the demonic and unruly forces of life and keep them at bay. But Jesus will be there. He'll be right there in the boat with you. Now, too often when the storms of life come crashing in on us, we tend to forget that Jesus is in the boat with us. And I venture to say that there are those of us in this room and online who are facing some sort of storms in our lives. Maybe it's just a heavy rain, like a squabble with a coworker or a disagreement with a partner. Maybe it's heavy rain with gale force winds, like not being able to find a job that pays enough or that whole dating thing just not working out. We forget that Jesus is weathering these relatively minor storms with us. But we also tend to forget that Jesus is in the, in the boat with us during the major storms, the tornadoes of our lives, when a long-term relationship ends, when we find ourselves financially underwater, when our parents or someone we love or we ourselves receive an ominous report from the doctor. And I choose to believe that this forgetfulness is not necessarily a lack of faith. In some cases, sure, but fundamentally, I believe it's a lack of understanding what faith is all about. If we don't realize that Jesus is in the boat with us, then we're allowing ourselves to be guided not by faith in his love and grace, but by fear. We give in to the panic that the storms around us naturally cause, instead of realizing that they aren't the real problem because storms are going to come and go in our lives, but the one constant that we have is the unconditional love and grace of Jesus Christ. 
when we realize that we can't control the storms around us any more than we can control the weather, then our need for God in the Christ who can bend, for faith in God in the Christ who can bend even the wind and the seas to his will, that becomes ever more important. Faith means we choose to not give in to fear, but instead center ourselves in the power of God. Faith means we choose to practice the spiritual disciplines of prayer, worship, study, and outreach, that all of which draw us closer to God. Faith means fully participating in this community that is bound together by God's Holy Spirit. But I have to warn you, when we choose faith over fear, when we choose to follow Jesus the Christ who stays with us in the boat, by definition, we're going to receive more storms than we can ever imagine. Retired Bishop Will Williman puts it this way, perhaps you thought there was going to be smooth sailing with Jesus. You thought with Jesus in the boat, there'd be no storm, no waves, no fear. No. Almost every page of the gospel proclaims that Jesus is the center of the storm. When Jesus is near and the wind picks up, the waves bang against the side of the boat and there's trouble because Jesus stands against the world and rather for justice and peace. When we're in the midst of our own storms, Jesus asks us that question of curiosity. Why? Why are you afraid? What is it that scares you? Now, I'm going to tell you that the first film on the Crossflix 2024 list is Barbie. How many of you have seen the Barbie movie? Just show of hands. Okay. You have however many months to go do that now. Now, next spring, Pastor Bridie and I are going to arm wrestle over who gets to preach on it. <laughs> Devin has absolutely no chance. Sorry. But because I have this feeling that she might be victorious, I want to give you a sneak peek of how I see that film answering the question, why are you afraid? And this is a spoiler alert, I'm just letting you know. After things start to go wrong in Barbie's life, she's directed to visit Weird Barbie. Well, Weird Barbie, who scares everyone, by the way, at first, listens to stereotypical Barbie talk about the strange time she's going through as well as the disturbing appearance of a patch of cellulite on her leg and her feet having gone flat, Weird Barbie tells her she has two choices. She holds up a pink high heel in one hand and a Birkenstock in the other. And she says, you can go back to your regular life or know the secrets of the universe. The choice is now yours. Well, of course, stereo typical Barbie picks the pink high heels. She wants to go back to her old but perfect life where every day is the best day ever. Kin is beach. Women dominate the Supreme Court and the presidency. Cellulite does not exist and high heels are comfortable because it's safe there. It's what she knows. But to her dismay, weird Barbie tells her, I told you you had a choice, but you really don't. You have to choose the Birkenstock, meaning she has to go into the real world and look for the truth without fear. And family, so do we. We need to seek the truth even when it's uncomfortable. We need to seek the truth even when we're afraid of the answer. We need to seek the truth when our fight or flight instinct is at full tilt. Because no matter what storm we find ourselves in the midst of, Jesus is in the boat with us, assuring us, reminding us that we must not be afraid, but rather have faith. John Wesley tells of the time as, that as a younger man, he was in a storm-tossed ship in the midst of the Atlantic. And he wrote, at noon our third storm began. At four it was more violent than before. The winds roared around about us and whistled as distinctly as if it had been a human voice. The ship not only rocked to and fro with the utmost violence, but shook and jarred with so unequal grating of emotion 
that one could not but with great difficulty keep holding on to anything nor stand a moment without it. Every 10 minutes came a shock against the stern or side of the ship, which one would think should dash the planks in pieces. But yet amidst the storm, Wesley found solace in a surprising source. Among his shipmates was a group of German Moravian Christians whose calm and peaceful strength impressed him so much that he wrote this in his journal. In the midst of the psalm wherewith their service began, the sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans, they calmly sung on. I asked one of them afterwards, were you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. But your women and children were not afraid? Remember, this was the 1700s. He replied mildly, no. Our women and children are not afraid to die. From them, I went to their crying, trembling neighbors and pointed out to them the difference in the hour of trial between him that feareth God and him that feareth him not. What can we learn from a sleeping Jesus and a group of singing Moravians that Jesus is always in the boat with us? Let us not be afraid, but let us live in faith. Amen. Following the postlude, if you would like to receive communion, please make your way to these first two rows. You do not need to be a member of this church or of any church. You simply have to have the desire to receive. Pastor Bridie will be consecrating, and you're then welcome to kneel for a time of prayer afterwards as well. There are goodies in the courtyard. I saw Dan Cox sneak in and sneak out. So uh, there are some homemade wonderfulness outside, so I hope you will come out, uh, grab something, and then go to uh, Dr. Hansen's class because it really is a wonderful opportunity that you have to help uh, unpack these six clobber passages. 
Go forth now, do not be afraid, but rather live in faith, and go out now to love and serve the world. Amen. If you'd like to join us for communion, please, you're invited to come to the front two rows here. 
Um, if you choose to stay in the sanctuary, we just ask that you continue in an attitude of quiet reflection until communion and our prayer time are over. And if I can ask the ushers to please close those back doors, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. As Pastor Kathy said in the United Methodist Church, the table.